Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, which is actually a, a re recording of a previous one. And um, I'll just uh, introduce myself. I'm Christine, and I am uh, the presenter. And this, I also I work in the field um, as an adult uh, literacy researcher and consultant. And I previously worked in an LBS program at the Ottawa Carleton District School Board. So the presentation is uh, based on a review project completed last year with Alpha Plus. Um, so here are the topics I'll be covering during the next half hour or so. And um, when the webinar is posted, uh, there will be links to some of the websites, articles and reports that are featured throughout the presentation. Okay. So we'll be looking at uh, what is referred to as the digital divide and the disparities that are part of that, even in um, a wealthy province like Ontario and a wealthy province like Canada. And we'll be looking at the digital divide and several elements, um, including things that might be obvious like availability and affordability, but we'll also look at the learning opportunities uh, that people can access and whether or not they can realize benefits from their learning. And then in the uh, later part of the presentation, we'll look at what's happening at the federal level and the provincial level to support inclusive access to technology and digital literacy. And then we'll wrap up with some interesting program and policy ideas from other jurisdictions. So for those of you listening who may not be familiar with Alpha Plus, it is a ministry funded support organization that offers tech coaching, support and training directly to literacy and basic skills programs. They also maintain a great website with resources and information that can be accessed by anyone interested in using technology to support adult learning. And the organization is also actively involved in producing, disseminating, and promoting research efforts. So the webinar provides some highlights of a comprehensive review of digital access challenges and opportunities for those adults who are considered vulnerable. And so that is those adults who are disconnected or sporadically connected and engaged online. The report the full report is available through the Alpha Plus website, and it was written by myself and Matthias Strum with support from Maria Moriarty and Suzanne Smythe, a faculty member and digital literacy and inclusion expert from Simon Fraser University. All right, so although issues of digital inclusion have been a long time concern, Ontario's digital transformation initiative is heightening that concern. Um, the province is gradually transforming the way it interacts with the public and provides services, moving many routine interactions and transactions online. So the move to online service means there will be less face-to-face -face service. And this transition may prove to be more complicated than anticipated. So for example, a year ago, this article tells us, um, said that the government reversed a decision to close nine service Ontario locations. Um, so the transition from in-person to online is not really unique and it's helpful to look at potential impacts and challenges in other provinces. So in British Columbia, their transition has had serious impacts on those receiving or applying for social assistance. So a new centralized phone line and an online application process have led to access barriers. So for, for example, long waits on phones became particularly problematic when most low income and social assistance recipients use cheaper pay as you go plans. In addition, required online access became a problem for those without an internet connection and with low levels of education and more tenuous literacy skills. 
So one researcher has observed a downloading of information and supports related to accessing government services. And in, in BC, public libraries and community computer sites are becoming the new social safety net she's observed. So what's happening is that questions she writes about housing, immigrant support services, government forms and job skills are increasingly answered using information provided at the library. Now, however, Ontario's digital transformation may be different as it does address inclusion opportunities for people to advance or gain new digital skills, especially those most in need. And the government has committed to helping create a society where everyone can participate in and benefit from digital technologies in their lives. Now, we don't know yet what this will look like. So the review project became a great opportunity to fully explore what it means to be a digitally inclusive enabled province. Now the federal government is also forging ahead with its own digital transformation project announced in the 2017 budget. However, this initiative and a previous um, initiative that was outlined in a document called Digital Canada 150 do not mention equity or digital literacy or a comprehensive approach to inclusion. When writing about the federal initiative, one reporter said the following, the federal government's approach to the digital divide is laughable. Years of committee meetings and expert submissions on a national digital strategy have resulted in no policy changes. So at the federal level, the government has made decisions that contributed that contribute to digital disparities rather than help alleviate them. So for example, um, funding for adult literacy, which could be used to address the issue, uh, has shifted from broad support for communities and various initiatives across the country to be focused on employment only. In addition though, that funding that was available has been consistently underspent uh, for the past several years. At the same time, in 2012, they withdrew funding from what was called the community access programs, which were uh, various sites across the country where people could access computer technology and, online, and get online. They also announced the closure of Service Canada offices but then in fact, they've reversed that decision too, similar to sort of what happened in uh, Ontario. And now there's uh, the same number, if not more offices are now open. The biggest thing that people were looking for was uh, more federal support for access to broadband and internet, which was announced last year. However, there's no mention of affordability uh, in that announcement. So one of the questions we did pose during the webinar, and it's something you could just think about, um, is whether or not you're seeing more requests from learners or people you work with to assist for that, to provide assistance in helping them access essential government services, whether they're federal or provincial. Okay, so we'll now look at what is meant by a digital divide and how people in Canada and Ontario may experience it. So simply affording an internet connection remains an issue for many low-income Ontarians. In addition, in addition, once people are online, differences in their education level, literacy and online problem solving and their access to supports contribute to the divide. So Ontario's digital, dig, digitally vulnerable adults are those who already experience social and economic inequalities. And one reporter writes, the digital divide is a, a spectrum. Almost everyone I met at community centers while reporting this story struggled with technology in some way. 
I spoke with Leanne Stein, a low-income woman who doesn't think she needs the internet. Desiree Ann McCallum, a single mom who, op who owns a tablet but doesn't know how to use it. And Taban Kershid, a new Canadian and mother of four who is digitally literate but can barely afford to stay connected. These are the diverse faces of Canada's new underclass. No single fix will solve their diverse dilemmas. So where one lives, your income and age will impact whether you have a household internet connection. Those with low incomes and who are over 65 are least likely to have a home internet connection and just over half of low income in Canadians have a home internet connection. A recent Ipsos survey of Canadians looked at use, whether at home or in the community, and they revealed very high rates of usage, meaning 95% of Canadians were accessing the internet in some way including in libraries, in schools, and at work. Um, and so then they looked more broadly at, well, what does that mean? And if what are the differences between those who can access at home and outside of the home? And they started to, they created these three groups of engagement. Um, so based on how engaged people were, whether they had high levels of engagement online, moderate or very low and low levels of, of engagement. And the people with low levels of engagement express some very real concerns that are good to keep in mind. Um, when thinking about connecting with folks um, and encouraging more online access. So one person said, there's many things I would like to do, but don't know how. And people also uh, in that group were quite hesitant because of trust issues. They weren't sure about security and what would happen to their personal information. One person said, I avoid activities online that require me to enter any personal information or accept privacy terms. And when we compare the two diverse groups, the very low or low engaged users and the very high and high engaged users, we start to again see the differences depending on age, whether one lives in rural or remote areas or a city, Education becomes an issue, whether one has less than a high school education or more. And of course, income is a division um, that creates disparities. Um, the interesting part of this one is they also showed that those who are accessing the internet outside the home will of course spend less time online compared to those who are accessing inside the home. And then this would contribute to sort of their comfort levels and uh, digital literacy. A very, something that um, governments need to keep in mind as they move many services online um, was revealed in this IPSO survey. And the researcher said that only the highly engaged users, which was a small number, 11%, tend to access government services online. And they said those who need access to government services the most face more digital access barriers. And results from PIAC, uh, the Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies, which is an international assessment of reading, computation, and online problem solving, show that Canada has one of the largest digi digital divides among OECD countries. And we also have one of the largest proportions of the population scoring at the lower levels on an online uh, test. So two Dutch researchers write, Although inequalities within society have always existed, the internet created an even stronger division. The higher status members increasingly gain access to more information than the lower status members. 
the internet is not only an active reproducer of social inequality, but also a potential accelerator. So what does it mean to be digitally inclusive as Ontario hopes to do? What is digital inclusion? So we found, I found a couple of uh, definitions from an American organization called the National Digital Inclusion Alliance that may be quite useful. Um, and the latter part I think is really important to consider that digital inclusion must evolve as technology advances. It requires intentional strategies and investments to reduce and eliminate historical, institutional, and structural barriers to access and use technology. So based on some of the uh, work we did in the review, here's a, a bit of an overview of the elements of in inclusion that we synthesized from some of the reading that uh, we included in the Fuller Report. And so we looked at inclusion as involving um, access and the availability to internet connections and devices, affordability of those connections and devices, and affordability uh, related to the devices one might need for a variety of activities. And we also looked at what it means uh, to, to learn about technology, and what are, whether people can realize benefits. So here's some of the details that we, uh, we synthesize and that I'll talk about too in the next part of the presentation. And this might be a checklist that you can take away and use and think about as you look at sort of your own communities um, that you work with. And one of the questions we posed uh, during the web webinar was what kind of access barriers do adults in your community experience? Not necessarily in your learning program, but in the community in general. Okay, so we'll now look at each of those elements of inclusion. Um, the first one, of course, is availability and Canada does have um, a geographical challenge in making sure that everyone does have access to high-speed internet. So there is a, an online sort of mapping system that one can look at to see what the access is or availability is in certain areas. Um, and this is related to the CRT, C, CRTC decision last year to ensure you know, availability across the country. But this, although it's a, a large investment of 750 million, it's going to take up to 10 years, they say, to ensure um, access to high-speed connections. In addition though, that CRTC TC decision didn't say anything about affordability. So um, ACORN, which is the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, a national organization of low and moderate income families, carried out a study about affordability. They surveyed 400 people online and on paper and asked them about internet affordability. And the vast majority of respondents said, um, the cost of a high-speed internet connection is extremely high for them. But they also said that uh, many of them do sacrifice basic needs, such as food or uh, electricity bills, just to pay for the internet connection. Low-income households tend to be mobile only, meaning they're being hit twice with high prices as well as some of the most punitive data caps in the world. Also, many low-income Canadians do not have an expensive smartphone, and non-smartphone users are more likely to be female, older, have a lower income, and live in a small community and have less education. There are affordable access initiatives um, in various places across the province and country, 
and they're attempting to address this issue. So for example, a partnership between the Toronto Public Library and Google offers free take-home Wi-Fi hubs, which can be loaned to library patient, patrons for up to six months. Um, and all Toronto Public Library branches and low-income neighbourhoods are involved in this initiative. There's also some corporate uh, support. So Rogers uh, Connected for Success program offers tenants in some low-income housing in Toronto, Ottawa and Waterloo, a basic internet connection for $9.99 a month. And the program is expanding to New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador. So a similar program is offered by TELUS out West, but nothing similar is offered by Bell. Now, currently, um, Rogers is reaching only about 15,000 tenants. And uh, in comparison, though, if you look at uh, the number of people in Ontario who receive social assistance, it's about 1 million. So many communities choose not to wait and have found their own grassroots solutions to offering online affordable access. So for example, the Chibucto Community Net Society installed affordable, high quality internet service for residents in low income, provincially, provincially owned apartment buildings. Now, this is an interesting example of what a community initiative can look like, but it also is an example of how far people have gone to offer access. And the board member of the Community Net Society actually sold a personal vehicle to afford access to two to 309 residents. So he stated this in a CRTC hearing, and he said it was a good trade and it needed to be done. It wasn't getting done, he said. Talking about it for years didn't do a thing. We figured if we gave an example that people could actually look at, the people could see that this is doable. Okay, Alpha Plus is also helping communities access affordable devices. They helped a literacy program build its own laptop lending library for students using some outdated equipment that was, was then updated with a, a Chromium operating system. But unlike in other countries, such as Germany, Canada does not have a regulatory framework that ensures affordable access for all. And if affordability is a pressing concern uh, for you and your students, you may want to consider joining ACORN's Internet for All campaign, which is focused on gaining comprehensive access for $10 a month um, for all low-income Canadians and Ontarians. Now, simply putting a connected device in someone's hands or signing people up for self-directed online courses or MOOCs will not have an impact. People and learning relationships do. So we'll now focus on the other two elements of digital inclusion, and that's the learning opportunities and benefits. So there's great potential in Ontario to have an impact on digital inclusion. And if you add up all of these, what I call the learning, participation in the learning and earning programs through different ministries, there's thousands of people participating. And potentially, if you add these up, we don't know how many of these are the same people accessing different programs, but you could say there's about a million sort of points of engagement where people are participating in libraries, going registering in language and literacy programs, adult credit and upgrading. And one of the uh, sort of other points of access we may not think about is all of the employment service centers that offer uh, computer stations uh, for people to get online what, during a, a job search. So there's great potential and uh, a bit of a, a widespread net out there where people could have uh, points of access. Um, however, the system is quite 
disjointed and there's no coordinated effort uh, to support what digital literacy and digital inclusion could look like through these programs. Um, so there's a few different initiatives underway and new funding has been announced for the literacy and basic skills program. And other programs are looking at hybrid learning projects or piloting e-learning projects. And uh, the LBS system also has an established distance learning component called eChannel. So we didn't though, although there's a variety of different activities, we didn't look closely at how or if the programs have a digital literacy component and what that looks like. Um, all we really had access to is sort of descriptions we could find online. So for example, when we were looking at the English as a second language program, we did find one study that was recently done where they looked at ESL programs and they concluded that there's inadequate and equitable access to e-learning infrastructure, including outdated computer equipment, poor internet connections and firewalls, and even insufficient electrical outlets, um, as well as limited tech support. The researchers also identified a need for professional training and ongoing support for instructors to support e-learning. In the adult literacy system, a recent evaluation report concluded that many programs are experiencing an overwhelming administrative burden that is primarily focused on compliance with no connection to learners' lives and pedagogy. So programs then have to spend substantial amounts of time on mandated reporting and testing, which is directly tied to funding and sacrificing time for program development and perhaps doing some other digital literacy kinds of learning uh, and initiatives. Now, there's also many adult secondary credit programs that uh, support some sort of e-learning and digital literacy learning. However, many of these programs rely on prepackaged curriculum courses, some of which are available from Ontario's Independent Learning Center. And to take a look, there's no real mention of digital literacy in these courses. So they had three technology related courses, one of them called Information and Communication Technology, which was focused on more of business software applications, an introduction to computer studies, which is really about coding. And then there is something called a media studies uh, course, but it actually doesn't require any online access. Now, what teachers do on the ground may be quite different, but not all students in the adult credit system have access to a teacher. And still thinking about sort of what digital literacy can look like and how it relates to uh, adult learners in their lives. One researcher found that students who'd failed Ontario's mandatory grade 10 literacy test, who were most in need of meaningful and relevant digital literacy development, encountered teaching and learning practices that are limited and irrelevant to their lives, concerns and interests. So study participants in a class designed for those who failed the test wanted to engage with texts that connected with their personal experiences and uses of literacy, what they referred to as real texts for real purposes. They also, had, uh, they also valued a variety of multimodal literacies that they didn't have access to in their course. So the researcher wrote that outside the course, the students felt empowered by their online literacy practices, but within the course in response to the remedial focus, literacy is seen to be a site of resistance. So there's many reasons that programs uh, may have to rely on these sort of old school approaches. Now we weren't a, we didn't fully explore that aspect in this project, but we did 
uncover, reveal some hints as to what is happening. And often this is related to overall funding levels, um, access, which means there's very little access to professional development, very few means for educators to connect with each other and share ideas and talk about new ideas. Um, little to no integration of research-based insights and opportunities um, to learn and to grow and to develop and try things out. In general, in Ontario, libraries are at the forefront of digital inclusion efforts, um, providing individual computer workstations and some very innovative technology to attract people and to get people involved. So, for example, the Toronto Public Library uh, has uh, video recording and 3D printers in what's called maker spaces. The Windsor Public Library has access to self-publishing equipment where one could uh, publish their own book. But libraries too are limited uh, and partly because of inequitable funding. So it's great to see expensive technology in use, um, but often it's really large urban areas who could afford such technology. And overall, there's a lack of coordination, um, and which also means that many libraries are limited in the kind of learning support that they can provide to patrons. So one question we posed was uh, whether participants could offer the kind of digital literacy and inclusion activities that they'd ideally like to offer um, within their programs. And we also have to sort of differentiate between on, you know, e-learning on online learning and general digital literacy. And it's um, digital literacy probably uh, feeds into uh, and access to other kinds of e-learning opportunities. So we really do want to focus on the digital literacy aspect. And so we're, we're talking about the ability and support to find relevant information and resources, to use social media, to connect with others, to share, um, to use things like learning videos or podcasts to help with any learning at home or for school or work. Of course, to obtain those essential government services um, and then to have some awareness and critically assess online posts and information. So the question was, what happens when we apply more of a digital equity lens to thinking about the opportunities for learning and digital literacy development? So digital equity um, is a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and economy. Digital equity is necessary for civic and cultural participation, employment, lifelong learning, and access to essential services. So what can these sorts of projects look like when we think of them in this way? So here's an example. Um, this often they rely on mentors and putting uh, different groups of people together. So in this example, it's uh, an e-health class for seniors led by University of Waterloo pharmacy students. And you can see they're using a tablet to uh, assist the seniors access important health related information. Or perhaps something like this um, can be developed. This is Appy Hour and this is at the public library where it's a planned drop in for people to come together to use their devices to learn about different um, apps and different ways of using their devices and different tools. And here's another example in this um, image, the a program has just received a um, 
funding to offer more of a family literacy approach. So the goal was to help newcomer parents use computers, smartphones, and other devices support to support their children's education. And we just found a, a quick example of a program that seemed to have quite a, a wide um, interpretation of what it looked like to have digital literacy included. And this program in Toronto offered a program around digital storytelling and fully integrated uh, technology into their Im immigrant women's integration program. Another program was a unique uh, partnership. Uh, Experience Annex in Hamilton has brought together a partnership between the libraries and um, Mohawk College. And the idea is to work with youth, have them come into the libraries, engage in the maker spaces and using technology, but also then to have a partnership with the college where they may be interested in pursuing post-secondary courses. And part of the way, uh, one of the reasons this program works is that the young people have access to what's called a youth navigator to help them with the uh, education system. We also looked at a couple of innovative um, programs in other jurisdictions where people can look to get ideas and to think about and also access research and think about uh, what digital digital literacy means. So a program called Digital Promise in the US has one of its sections uh, specifically for uh, devoted to supporting adult learning. And they have a variety of good resources online. And their intention too is they are also working with uh, tech developers and educators to uh, actually develop some uh, apps and learning apps for adults. Another interesting organization also in the US is called Connected Learning. And they have a, a broader vision of what digital learning and literacy could look like, but it's built around, the concepts are interesting because it's built around um, young people's individual interests. And I think what they're doing related to young people could easily apply to uh, adults also. And the Good Things Foundation in the UK is sort of this massive online portal, which people from several funders and several different sectors can access. So it's interesting to think about, for example, if you work in a library or a language program or a literacy program or upgrading, there is a centralized online place where people can go to get ideas um, and to get support about developing digital literacy projects. Now, Alpha Plus did receive funding um, to do a second year of work, and this funding is intended to look more closely at programs and some of the opportunities and barriers that literacy and basic skills programs have when thinking about digital literacy programs and supports. And uh, so we hope to visit a few different programs during this winter and to uh, do a, a bit of a case study project. And uh, that wraps up the webinar. So we ended with some questions and uh, some ideas about looking at broader issues around digital literacy and supports that are needed. So thanks very much, everyone.